All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here to speak with you today over the web and tell you about what my lab is working on. Um, so we're a, primarily a microfluidics lab, a microfluidics lab that builds technology for doing uh, biological research. Essentially, we, we consider ourselves research tools builders. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about a major focus in the lab. It's about a, what a third of my lab does, um, where we use droplet-based microfluidics to uh, perform single cell multiomics. So uh, droplet-based microfluidics is a subfield of microfluidics where um, the overall concept is to uh, use microfluidic devices to form these um, very small picoliter volume droplets of water uh, that are surrounded by an immiscible oil phase. And uh, the microfluidic devices form them and they also process them. Uh, and it, functionally, the way that we think of it is that the droplets are the reaction containers, the test tubes, if you will, and the microfluidics are the graduate students or the robots or the pipetters. They're the, the uh, instrumentation that is performing the operations on those test tubes to do the biology that we'll want to do. So um, when, when we, um, generally the way the research goes is that we conceive of an idea, you know, a new, you know, it'd be great to be able to form some new measurement. Um, and we think about what that measurement entails and we break it down into a bunch of different steps and we then build a microfluidic instrument in essence that uh, automates doing those different steps. Uh, and it's usually just, you know, what you would typically do by hand, you know, at the bench, but now we, we miniaturize that into a microfluidic chip and all of those steps are done with full automation on the chip or as much automation as we can get. And so shown in this slide are the basic uh, modules, we call them of droplet microfluidics, uh, which are, um, you know, first uh, here at the top left is a droplet chip. generator. This is the microfluidic device that generates the test tubes. Uh, it also encapsulates samples. So if you have, say, a suspension of cells and you want to analyze individual cells, you'd use that droplet generator to encapsulate those cells in individual droplets where they could be further processed. Um, encapsulation is just the, usually the first and most basic thing we need to do in droplet microfluidics. Uh, if you want to do more complex um, assays on, for example, those cells that you've encapsulated, this will require you to go and often add reagents to the droplets, which we do by pico injection, which is the, the movie in the middle there. Uh, and then sometimes when we want to add a large volume to a given droplet, so let's say we digest a cell uh, to open up its genome, get its genome ready for, for um, analysis, at that point, we essentially want to do a buffer exchange and add a new reagent, and we do that by expanding that small concentrated droplet into a very large droplet, as shown in that movie to the top right. Um, and there's a bunch of other different modules uh, in droplet microfluidics. Uh, these are kind of the most um, commonly used uh, modules that um, allow you to just uh, form a huge number of droplets and encapsulate uh, lots of cells, lots of particles, molecules, and so on, um, and to do multi-step reactions in the droplets. Uh, now, the reason that this is so powerful is that is really the speed and the very tiny size of these droplets. So um, 
the, the natural time scale of droplet microfluidics is around a kilohertz. So the natural rate at which the droplets are going to be formed and processed by the microfluidic devices is about a thousand droplets per second. And it could be substantially higher, up to a hundred times higher than that. And it could be uh, substantially lower, about a hundred times lower, uh, you'll see devices. So it spans a broad range. But um, the, the real sweet spot where this technology really shines is in making a huge number of droplets very rapidly. And because those droplets are only picoliters, that's uh, you know, roughly 10, uh, 10 to the minus 12, and usually these are between uh, 10 microns to about 100 microns, so you're talking about 50 picoliters of volume, uh, you can make an enormous number of droplets from just a relatively small amount of reagents. I believe about a half mil of sample can form about a billion 10 micron droplets. So, um, you know, if you had a way to usefully use every one of those droplets, you could imagine doing an enormous number of assays. Um, and so, uh, where droplet microfluidics has really gone is into application areas where um, you need, there's this need for very high throughput um, analysis. And so much of the current uh, space is focused in single cell analysis, where you have a large number of cells that you want to analyze individually. And there, the throughput, the ability to take a suspension of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cells and isolate them in individual droplets, and also the very small volume, uh, which keeps the cellular um, components, whether it's the lysate of a cell that you've digested or a secreted molecule, it keeps it concentrated to that cell in this very small droplet. Uh, that is what enables you to get a good measurement as well. You have essentially a very high sensitivity because um, even though you're starting from a very small amount of material, you know, let's say just one cell or literally one molecule, um, the actual re rel the actual concentration in that droplet, because the droplet is so small, is in a range where you can actually do a measurement. You can actually do reactions reliably. Um, so those components are the basic components that allow us to make lots of droplets. Um, in some instances, there's also a need to sort through that huge emulsion that you form. So maybe you're going to use those three components to make about 10 million droplets, which is kind of typical for us. Now what do you do? Um, you have 10 million droplets in a tube. Each droplet has a different cell or a different molecule in it. How do you get the, the, the material or the, the information out of that tube to do the next steps of your experiment? And that's where the final movie at the bottom comes in, and this is something called a flow dropometer. Uh, we call it a flow dropometer or fluorescence activated droplet sorter. And what it is is basically the droplet microfluidic analog to a, flow, to a fluorescence activated cell sorter. Um, we take our droplets that have been formed you know, by our previous instrument, we pack them together and flow them into this device that scans them with a laser and then sorts them according to the fluorescence measurement uh, that's picked up by the detector. And it's built basically like a flow cytometer, at least in terms of the analysis part. Um, you have a multicolor detector with filters and so on that are capturing the emitted fluorescent light. Uh, and then that's being analyzed in real time by a computer to determine whether to sort a droplet. The sorting is based on a, a different force from typical fax machine. Uh, it uh, uses dielectrophoresis. Uh, and, and that's really enabled by the fact that we have an emulsion. We have a, a conductive droplet uh, in an emissible non-conductive oil. And that um, difference in, in the, um, the, the electrical properties of those fluids, the conductive versus the non-conductive carrier phase, allows us to take advantage of dielectrophoresis to apply very large forces to these very, very tiny droplets and actually do deflections, as you can see in this movie, to sort. Um, so uh, these are kind of the complete toolkit of droplet microfluidics. And uh, when you conceive of a new idea, typically you take these components and you mix and match them together and to, to optimize for whatever you're trying to accomplish. And what I'm going to tell you through the rest of this talk is a few specific uh, applications where we've taken these modules and we've built specific instruments to perform a measurement that we thought was important. Um, so... Uh, the first thing I'm going to tell you about is uh, single-cell DNA sequencing. Uh, and, and this really gets to the bigger theme of my talk, which is on single-cell multi-omics. So um, um, omics, you know, this is a, a term that's used to describe when you want to perform a, a um, kind of a broad profiling 
of a, a universal kind of information. So the typical omics is genomics, which we've all probably heard of before, where you want to characterize the entire genome of an organism, let's say, or the, the collection of genomes coming out of a microbial ecosystem where you could have uh, literally millions of distinct cells in just a small, you know, uh, a teaspoonful of, of seawater, for example. Um, now, multi-omics basically describes doing multiple kinds of omics simultaneously. And, and that's what my the primary idea of my talk is. Single cell DNA sequencing would be kind of the base omics that we're gonna perform. And um, the reason that you would wanna perform this in the case of let's say microbes is that if we look at the microbial world, you know, there's a huge diversity of, of organisms um, and, and, and even just, you know, a, a, a relatively boring sample, like a piece of um, crud on the bottom of your shoe could have thousands of different species of bacteria and yeasts and so on all mixed together. Um, and, uh, you know, we uh, we are also ecosystems for for um, microbes as well. And, you know, our, our uh, gut is full of microbes that help us digest food and sometimes can make us sick. We have microbes all over our skin. And understanding this microbial life, this diversity is actually um, potentially very important to understanding how those ecosystems function in the case of human health, how they impact human health. Now, the big challenge really comes from the fact that um, the amount of DNA encoding an individual uh, microbe is actually fairly large. So, uh, you know, if you think about it just in terms of information, you have on the order of um, roughly 10 million nucleotides for just a very simple microbe, a simple bacterium. Uh, and if you imagine having hundreds of thousands of these in a piece of dust or, you know, a, a milliliter of seawater, um, that's a lot of individual genomes that are going to be there, you know, 100,000 times times uh, 10 million, uh, a little bit. And that's just in a tiny, tiny uh, amount of sample. Uh, now, how... And, and all of those are all of those microbes. They're different species. They're totally different organisms. So how can we look at that sample, analyze it, and make sense of all of that diversity that's there? Well, the, the common approach to doing that is to do what's called metagenomic sequencing. It's kind of a jargony term that basically says that you make no attempt to actually sequence the the, the um, bacteria singly. And instead, you just collect all of their DNA into one pool, and you sequence it as a mixture. And that's typically what's done in metagenomic sampling, metagenomic sequencing. Um, now, you can imagine the challenges associated with trying to analyze that kind of data. Um, just a huge number of different cells being mixed together with different properties. Um, usually, the data that you get out, it's shotgun sequencing, which means the, the genomes are fragmented into short pieces of only maybe 100 or a couple hundred base pairs in length. And so you have this um, cloud of tiny reads that don't necessarily overlap and are not physically connected together in any meaningful way that you can infer easily. So how do you make sense of that? And uh, much of the field is actually focused on exactly that problem. How do I make sense of this cloud of data to say something about that ecology? But it's in essence, it's a you know at some point it's a it's a futile errand. Uh, the fragmentation and sequencing of those genomes discards information that you simply can never re recover by um, just trying to piece bits together in the metagenome. And so that was really the motivation of this project, which is to say, well, can we take advantage of the throughput of droplet microfluidics to sequence each of the cells in that sample individually to keep the genomes intact um, so that we don't have this problem of mixing together DNA from different species that now makes it impossible for us to figure out what is this, what are the genes of this particular species and what are its properties. And so the strategy that we took was to essentially um, uh, miniaturize and automate library preparation that's typically done in well plate formats where you could have 384 wells in a well plate. We miniaturize that down to droplets. And rather than having, you know, let's say 10 microliters of sample in each of our wells, we have 10 picoliters of sample in each of our droplets just enough to hold a single cell and all of the molecular biology to do the reaction. And what the, the overall concept here is that what you wanna do is at the end of the day, you need to get all of the DNA onto one sequencing run because the sequencing instrument is a very um, powerful and um, high throughput way to sequence DNA. It's a very um, cost effective way to sequence DNA, uh, but it's also not designed for sequencing uh, single cells. So we need to somehow get all of that DNA coming from, let's say, 100,000 different cells into one sequencing run, but still know which piece, which little fragment came from which cell in the original sample. And that's where our microfluidics come in. And what we did was we, we um, came up with a way 
to label the different uh, DNA molecules coming off, the different uh, fragments coming off of a single cell genome with the unique identifier we call a barcode, um, essentially a small tag that tells you which droplet that DNA came out of. Um, and every read that gets on the sequencer has a tag on the end of it that tells you its droplet of origin. And so we can infer all of the reads with the same tag came from the same droplet and therefore the same cell. And so that allows us to take a mixture of reads as is shown on the left here and sort them according to their, their barcode tags back into single droplets and single cells. Once you have single cell genomes, you can then do analysis to figure out what are the properties of that cell. Um, so this is the microfluidic instrument that we built and published to do this. Um, the first step is a device that lyses the cell and amplifies the genome um, that uses a droplet generator. Uh, at that point, you now need to um, fragment the genome, and that is done by an enzymatic reaction that um, breaks the genome into pieces, into short pieces typically in a couple hundred base pairs in length, and also attaches uh, universal primers on the ends. And those primers allow us to come in, and in the third step, by a PCR reaction, add the barcodes that are unique to that droplet. Um, and so we had three modules, as you can see. Um, and the last module, the, the barcoding module, is where we merge the tagmented genome of a single cell with a barcode droplet that has a single molecule, a single sequence, a barcode sequence, into a large droplet that contains the enzyme react the enzymes for the doing the reaction. And that's where we get the uh, fragments to get the barcodes on them. Uh, the result of all of that is then a bunch of droplets where each droplet has a fragmented, amplified, and barcode, barcoded genome from one cell. You could just break that emulsion by adding a demulsifier and then collect the, the aqueous fraction, which has all the DNA now properly indexed, and you could put it on the sequencer and essentially get the kind of information that I described earlier. Um, so uh, the net result of that is that you have in your computer, basically, you have now a list of barcode groups, barcode clusters we call them, and a given barcode cluster has all of the reads, the sequence reads coming from a single cell or a single droplet. Um, and so it's kind of a profile of that cell's genome. And um, the cool thing about that is that, so, so one of the problems actually is that you're starting from one genome. So you're never going to get 100% coverage, meaning literally you're never going to read every single base of a single cell because there's loss in all of these steps. It's, they're not 100% efficient. Typically, you get on the order of 5 10% of a single cell's genome. And what this means is that much of the genome doesn't actually connect together. You have sort of reads that may be near each other, but there's a gap between them. There's no way to know where they are with respect to one another. Now, in the case of typical metagenomics, this is a major problem because if two reads aren't physically connected, there's no way at all to associate them. There's no way to know that this read and this read are in the same genome or in totally different genomes corresponding to different species. However, when we barcode our, our genomes, those disconnected reads now have a tag telling us they were from the same cell. And so we can associate them together even if they're not physically connected. And this is very powerful because it allows us to generate association maps from the kinds of things that you simply can't do easily with metagenomics. So for example, um, the different kinds of phenotypes you think of with bacteria that you care about and you want to um, be able to characterize are things like antibiotic resistance, right? Something that makes a, a particular species able to um, resist an antibiotic. Um, virulence factor, something that could take, let's say, a, an E. coli that is that is essentially benign and turn into a pathogenic E. coli that can make you very, very sick. Um, you know, these two things are encoded by essentially modular components of genetic sequence that are shared between microbes. And so you could see a virulence factor um, in, in one species and the exact same virulence factor in a totally distinct species because um, bacteria tend to mix DNA with one another. Um, and so there's not a way to associate that virulence factor with a specific species. However, we can do that because we know now that that virulence factor has that tag that was associated with all of the rest of the reads coming from that cell. So now we can robustly associate it and we can associate it with other things that we can measure like antibiotic resistance. And it's really the combination of these factors that you wanna be able to characterize when you're looking at, you know, am I gonna get sick with a, a drug resistant um, strain of E. coli or, or something, right, um, in the sample. And that's something you can really only get robustly from uh, single cell DNA sequencing. Another interesting thing, which is a related kind of um, 
challenge, an informatic challenge, is characterizing the relationships between bacteriophages and bacteria. So down at that microbial world level, you have a, a war going on between between bacteria and the viruses that infect them. And, and um, as you might expect, I mean, it's a zoo of different kinds of creatures down there. There's a huge number of different viruses that infect um, bacteria. And what um, is, exp is known is that actually a, a single bacteria, a single virus may infect multiple different types of bacteria, and also a single bacterium might be infected by multiple viruses. And so you can imagine a very complicated network of interactions between the bacteria and the viruses that infect them. And this is a way, because the, you know there isn't a necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence between a virus and, and bacteria species, this is a way, the single cell analysis is a way now to associate them robustly, because if we see virus DNA or RNA within the the cell body, by, by, as measured by this method, of a given bacterium, now we know that virus was at least present, physically present with the bacterium, and we can start to generate complex um, phage host interaction maps. Um, so this, you know, and, and I guess just to summarize all of this, the reason that this is powerful is that it gives us now this ability to really untangle the the, the kind of the, the hairball um, of, of, of complication that you typically see in a metagenomic um, sequence analysis, because now we can associate uh, collections of reads with single cells. And because of the use of droplet microfluidics, which is so fast, we can do this for hundreds of thousands of single cells in a single experiment. So we're getting you know, an extremely high throughput map or a very comprehensive map of what's present in that sample. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the the issues with um, bacteria, however, is that it's uh, metagenomics is definitely important, and there's a large number of scientists who study it, but it's not necessarily the most um, important to human health. Um, and so, you know, we re we recognize when we built that technology, you know, that sh it has these three different components. Uh, this is something that an individual lab is never going to be able to easily replicate because it, it requires just far too much skill. Um, to, to, to build the chips and to run them properly. So, you know, clearly if this is a useful technology, which we try, definitely believe it is, you, you essentially need to commercialize. You need to turn into, uh, you know, an idiot proof box that can run every time. And so we thought about commercializing and I created a company called Mission Bio, which now sells this instrument, but they're not focused on microbes anymore. They're, they're focused on, um, on cancer because cancer is another example where uh, uh, heterogeneity of genomic sequence is relevant to the phenomenon that you're interested in, which is how does cancer develop, grow, resist therapy, and so on. Um, the, the other nice thing about uh, commercialization is that uh, you get professional engineers rather than graduate students building things. Not the graduates, they, are, they did a great job, but they're not professional engineers with uh, you know decades of experience. And so uh, at Mission Bio, they were able to really take that complex workflow and um, reduce the complexity down significantly into just two steps that run in a fully automated fashion on a single chip. Um, it has essentially the same steps as before. Uh, we have an encapsulation and a, di a digestion. This digestion uses a protease that's optimized for digesting human cells. Um, and then there's a barcoding step where that digested lysate gets simultaneously amplified and barcoded, uh, and you get out the similar kind of tagged sequence data. So why did they switch to cancer and why is that important? Well, um, cancer is a complex disease where the changes in the genome essentially dictate how the disease is going to progress over time. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a randomized process that is under an, a kind of selection, very much like a Darwinian evolution. You know, the cancer cells are mutating and being selected for uh, their ability to grow within the body. Uh, and so how that process happens, first of all, is not um, defined, necessarily well-defined, right? It can, it can literally be different for every single person that has uh, given cancer. And so you can imagine a complex um, uh, 
array of outcomes, especially at the genetic level, for different people with that disease, which is sort of highlighted here, where you could have, you know, a single cancer cell branching off into multiple different genetic lineages. Now, the reason that this is important to map is that your goal when you're um, when you're treating cancer is to kill all of the cancer cells because if you don't kill them all uh, and you leave you know a cell that can grow without end behind eventually that can kill the patient and this is a known problem of course in cancer it's one of the reasons it's essentially an incurable disease in most scenarios is that um, cancer does evolve in much you know just in many ways like according to Darwinian evolution where Initially, the, you, you'll have the initial um, diagnosis of cancer, you'll apply a treatment, you'll have a remission where you kill many of the cancer cells, but not all. And then over time, those cancer cells grow back and you typically get a resistant uh, form of the disease that is no longer responsive to that first treatment. So you now need to apply a second treatment that's distinct. You knock the cells down, you get remission, you buy some years, hopefully, but then it's going to come back. Um, and so uh, you're you're effectively performing a selection uh, on top of this heterogeneity, this genomic heterogeneity, and you can imagine that if we had a way to characterize in detail the genetics of the disease at this early stage, maybe we could choose our treatments better to prevent this um, this regrowth. You know, to kill essentially all of the cancer cells that are most important to kill. And so that was really the vision of the company, and uh, they built the technology around doing that. And um, this is a nice example where you could start to see the, the need for this sort of a thing. So here's a patient that um, early on had, uh, 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 when we characterized their cancer cells using the mission biotechnology, saw that the, the population basically consisted of a, by far a dominant population of these blue cells, which have this combination of mutations in the genome, and a small population of cells, these green cells, that have this uh, other combination, IDH2 slash SF3B1. Um, and then actually there's a red population, which we didn't even pick up at, at the beginning. Uh, treatment is applied, the, the blue population narrows, the green population sort of stays the same. Um, as another treatment is applied, the blue population narrows even more, but the green population is starting to expand. And now that red population, which we didn't even detect at the beginning, starts to expand as well. And by the time there's a full relapse, what we find is that the blue population is essentially nearly gone. It's still present, but it's, it's massively reduced compared to the initial fraction. Uh, but now we have this green population taking around nearly half of the cells, the cancer cells, and this red population taking about a quarter. I mean, at this point, you have a resistant... Uh, a uh, tumor is no longer responsive to the to the treatment. Um, so, it, would there have been a way for us to detect the these red the red cells and the green cells um, and have chosen a therapy that would have prevented them from recurring? And that's really the hope, and the goal. Um, so, that's the sort of thing that we're interested in doing with single cell. Um, multi single cell DNA analysis. And I just want to add a little bit before we get into some more detail of that on how we're using this for um, single cell multiomics, why we want to do single cell multiomics. So the genome is kind of the most basic programming of a cell, uh, of what a cell is. Um, but that genetic information is transcribed into RNA, and then that RNA is translated into protein. And so information flows from the genome through the transcriptome to the proteome. And in many ways, you can think of it as the genome as being the, you know, it's the genotype, it's the fundamental programming. And the pro the proteome is the is kind of what the cell actually is. It's actually the cell body and provides all of its functionality or much of its functionality, the enzymes and so on, its binding properties with different, its ability to recognize different molecules and so on is really in a proteome. And so um, if we are just focused on the DNA of the cell, we will be limited to the genomics, to just the, the basic programming. But we will not necessarily know how that programming manifests as the actual cell. And what is known is that actually the way information goes from that basic programming to the actual phenotypes of the cells is very complicated and controlled. In fact, um, you know, we all we are comprised of cells that all have identical genomes, essentially, um, and yet we have skin cells and liver cells and heart cells and so on that have different phenotypes. So um, you can't just be, you can't assume that a fixed genotype will always lead to the same phenotype. There is not a one-to-one -one linkage there. And so the goal of doing multiomics is really to be able to start to to tie together genotype and phenotypes at the single cell level so we can understand how genotypes drive different phenotypes under different circumstances. So one of the first ways that we saw, thought to do this 
was to um, try to start to capture um, protein information into uh, our multiomics analysis. And our idea was, well, um, you know, uh, just to go back to this slide, you know, G sequencers, DNA sequencers are great machines. We want to use them as much as we can, but they are DNA sequencers. They are not protein sequencers. You analyze DNA with them. You don't analyze protein with them. So how could we integrate um, protein information into the sequence data that we get out of our DNA sequencer rather than having to do two totally disparate measurements, right? A, a measurement of the genome and simultaneously a measurement of the proteome with two disparate methods would be very, very challenging to do at the single cell level. So our goal was really how could we merge those two measurements into something we could read out with a sequencer. And our idea was to use something called an aptamer, which is um, a piece of DNA or RNA that uh, in many ways is kind of, it, it behaves sort of like an antibody, but it is itself just a nucleic acid. So an aptamer is just a piece of DNA or RNA that folds into a, a confirmation, and that confirmation has the ability to recognize specific molecules or epitopes and actually bind to cells, but it is nothing but a nucleic acid. So if you were to take those aptamers that bind to specific cells and label the cells, as is shown in this slide, if we take this collection of aptamers, mix them with the different cells, and allow them to bind, if we choose aptamers that bind specifically to certain cell types or, or certain epitopes, then now what we would end up with is essentially we've added synthetic DNA to the cell. It's the aptamers bound to the cell. And so if we, we can now take that cell and we can sequence it using our, our the, pre, the approaches that I've described earlier, and we could simultaneously get information about the genome and the aptamers that are bound to it. And so this is a way to start to integrate uh, protein information into the into the measurement. And the nice thing is that there's a variety of aptamers that have already been described. And we basically showed that you could just pull some aptamers off the shelf and you could bind cells to them. They bind specifically, and we could correlate that information with the cell type, the known cell type. Um, so aptamers are nice, but one of the issues with aptamers is that uh, they're not as uh, they're not always as good as antibodies for binding. They're not as potent binders. There's not as many available. And um, there's just certain things you, you can't bind as well with, with aptamers because of the fact that they're nucleic acids that you can do with, with antibodies. And so we, we wanted to figure out, well, could we use a similar kind of technique for antibody-based binding? Um, now, this is, of course, um, there, there is a long history of using antibodies to characterize cells. Uh, this is typically done using a flow cytometer where you'll take an antibody labeled with fluorescent dyes and you'll bind it to a suspension of cells and then those cells will become fluorescent ba based on whether or not they bind that antibody. And if you take different antibodies labeled with different colors of dyes and you make a cocktail, you can now um, take a mixture of cells, um, um, adhere that mixture of antibodies to them and you'll get cells becoming fluorescent in different combinations of colors depending on which antibodies bind to them. And then of course you deconvolute all this information with a flow cytometer. Now, the challenge with that process, I mean, it works great and it's been you know, one of the mainstays of, of immunology and other um, cell biology uh, experiments for, for decades now. But the challenge with it is that um, you know, there are literally tens of thousands of distinct antibodies you may wanna use or, or even more. Um, to characterize a population of cells. But there's there's only so many colors of fluorescent, distinctive colors of fluorescent dye that you can use simultaneously. And typically what this means is that it's difficult to do one of these assays with more than just a handful of antibodies, five, 10. You know, if you're a real expert lab, maybe you can do 20. But that's really where it bottles, it, 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 um, it runs out. And the reason is that, you know, the visible light spectrum, which you're limited to for the fluorescence analysis is only so wide and, and you can only fit so many different channels in there. Um, now, uh, a solution, a very clever solution to this was to recognize that you don't necessarily need to use light, uh, fluorescence light as uh, the way to label antibodies. There's other labels you could use. And in particular, um, you could use rare earth elements, which have very sharp, uh, very narrow peaks as read out on a, on a um, mass cytometer. And this allows you now essentially to have up to tens or, or even up to a hundred distinct antibodies labeled with different, what are called mass tags. They essentially take the form of a fluorescence, uh, they, they play the same role as a fluorescence probe, but it's uh, it's read out with a mass cytometer, a mass spectrometer. But even then you run out of channels, the distinctive channels, because there's just so many rare earths. So our idea, which we called ABSEQ, uh, 
was a was essentially to recognize well we could swap out those those um, mass tags now or those fluorescent tags we could swap those out with a DNA tag. Right? So we generate a contract, as is shown on the right, which is an antibody with the DNA oligo attached to it. And now you could bind your cells with that antibody. And when you do that, you effectively pull onto that cell that synthetic nucleic acid tag. And so this molecule, this oligo function, uh, this, this um, oligo conjugated antibody is essentially kind of a, a transducer. It transduces a protein-based signal, as is recognized by the, the antibody, into a nucleic acid signal that you can read out with your... Um, with your DNA sequencer, uh, and and the nice thing about this, similar to similar to the aptamer work, is that now we can just uh, sequence that DNA along with the DNA of the cell, getting tagging it just the same way using the barcodes, and we can get all of that information out simultaneously. Um, so we built a microfluidic device to do that, and uh, it uses basically exactly the same method that you've seen previously. And lo and behold, we're able to uh, label different cells with different combinations of antibodies and get nice clusters that look, for all intents and purposes, they look like uh, what you get from a flow cytometer using fluorescence uh, tags. But these are our, our informatic counts, se sequence counts um, uh, to label the different spots here. And what um, some very clever labs recognize is that, well, um, you can actually combine ABSeq in combination with RNA-seq as well and perform multiomics. These are called site-seq and reap-seq, where they recognize that if you just polyadenylate the um, oligo tag that we're using to label our, our um, antibodies, those will be captured by the RNA sequence analysis uh, that's typically used because you all mRNA is polyadenylated in eukaryotes. And so if you polyadenylate your antibody tags, those are going to get captured by the same molecular biology. And so now you can start to do protein and RNA. And actually, these are now available through some commercial companies. Um, for DNA and protein, it's a little more challenging because um, uh, in the DNA analysis, we're not doing an, a poly-A capture. Uh, we are actually sequencing um, distinct loci of the genome that have distinct um, uh, 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 primers associated with them. So in the case of a cancer cell, you may want to sequence 40 or 50 different loci to characterize the heterogeneity of that cancer across known genes. Uh, so now we also need primer sets to, to get to our antibodies as well. And that is something that we now can do. We call this method DNA and AppSeq, or we, we give it the moniker DAPSeq. Um, and we show that we can get simultaneously a very nice coverage of the genome for those light loci and simultaneously uh, antibody profile information. Now, uh, being able to do RNA and antibodies is nice. Uh, it, it definitely adds information to do the two together. But in some sense, it's not as powerful as it would be able to be able to do DNA and either RNA or antibody. And the reason for that is that RNA is kind of an intermediate between DNA and protein. And in many ways, it represents the phenotype of the cell best. Um, you can certainly get genotype information out, but it's only going to be the genotype of the expressed genome, the genome that actually gets translated into RNA or transcribed into RNA. Um, the rest of the genome, which is the vast majority of the genome, is not transcribed and therefore is not going to be readable. Um, and mutations there, and especially copy number variants and so on, these are very important to cancer. So really, ideally, what you you know when you're doing RNA and, and antibody, you're sort of getting phenotype and phenotype, phenotype one and a phenotype two, which is related. What you would really like is genotype and a measure of phenotype. And that's really what the DNA and antibody allows you to do, is it gives you the genotype measured directly from the genome, unambiguously, and the phenotype as inferred from the antibody-based binding. And so what I'm going to tell you about now is how we've used this to... Um, perform a fairly detailed analysis of um, genotype-phenotype relationships in recurrent AML. AML is a, uh, a leukemia that is, uh, it, it tends to um, attack the young, and it's, uh, it can, it's often very deadly. And so it's something that we were very motivated to see if we could apply this technology to, and Mission Bio has been very motivated to this as well. So our DABSeq workflow is, has been streamlined quite a bit. It now runs on the Mission Bio platform. We got it running on the platform. Initially, the platform didn't do that. I just did DNA by itself, but we optimized it to do um, antibodies as well. My lab did. And, you know, the workflow is as you'd expect. So we take um, cells from, we take blood cells from a patient. We 
have a, a panel of antibodies, essentially a mixture of different antibodies to different known surface profiles that are known to be uh, different epitopes that are known to be important in this disease, each of them labeled with a different oligo. Um, we then bind those cells with those antibodies and we get, as you can see on the left there, you know, as, as a cartoon, cells that have um, you know, different cancer cells or normal cells all mixed together where they have antibodies binding to them depending on their surface profile. Those cells then get processed through the two-step microfluidic workflow that's run by Mission Bio's machine called Tapestry, and they get barcoded. And during the barcoding step, we analyze the genome, and we get the surface um, profile as well. And what you can think of it as, as is the, you know, I, I tend to think of it as the genotype as being kind of the independent variable, and the phenotype as being the dependent variable. Um, you, you, um, although you can you can mix them around if, if you'd like, uh, whatever is easy to think about. Um, but in essence, what we want to do is we want to know for this genotype what are the sets of phenotypes, surface profile phenotypes that we see, and this will allow us to do uh, quite a complex mapping because right now, in AML and actually in most blood cancers, you do one or the other. Either you do a genotype analysis um, by characterizing all the mutations present in the genome, sometimes at the single cell level or you do a phenotype analysis where you'll run flow cytometry or mass cytometry to get this combination of surface profiles to fractionate the different cancer cell and normal cell populations into clusters based on what the proteins that they're expressing on their surface are. With this approach, we can now do all of that and have linked genotype phenotype information at the single cell level. So just to show how this worked, the first thing we wanted to do is we, we just um, took some blood cells, normal PBMCs, and we did the, uh, the analysis using DABseq. And uh, what we found, what you see here on the left is uh, the UMAP clustering of that data from the different antibodies that are binding. And you can see that we have different clusters associated with the different kinds of cells present in the blood. And those different cell clusters, as shown on the right, um, express different markers. And uh, blood cells have been very well characterized. The surface profiles of those bloods have been very well characterized. And so you can actually use this data to annotate what those cells are and say, you know, this is a CD4 positive T cell. This is a natural killer cell. This is a dendritic cell, dendritic cell, and so on, based on what combination of surface profiles we get. So we get very nice data from the APSEC component of um, the Mission Bio Machine. Um, to show that this is really now going to provide linkage information, the next thing we did was we took a different, we took two different cell or uh, three different cell lines, where each of those cell lines is known to have both uh, distinctive genotypes and distinctive surface profiles, and they're known. All of those, all of that information is known. These are cell lines, and so what we should find is that um, the the genotypes of a specific cell type will correspond with its surface profile, and so when we do the analysis, indeed, what we find is that we get three clusters, as you can see on the left. Um, we can classify them by surface profile using antibodies, and we classify them into those three different clusters, JERCATs, K552, K and RAGI cells. And now we can go one level deeper and look at the genotypes. And when we map the genotypes on top, we find that indeed the cells have the correct genotypes corresponding to the, to the known phenotypes. So this is just essentially just showing that the technology works. We are able to measure simultaneously the genotypes and the phenotypes of cells. So now we turn to an actual um, uh, case of um, AML in a, in a patient. And uh, shown on top is the history of that patient. So, so all of the patients I'll tell you about today, all of these people have undergone um, extension. They've have they have histories that predate when we get their samples. Um, so this patient, we the, we got the sample at their second relapse, um, where they were known to have uh, these two mutations, the DN. DNMT3A and the MPM1 mutations. That was the primary uh, cancer cell population. Uh, if therapy was applied, you could see that you were successful in reducing that uh, red population down. Uh, over time, they, they started to have um, outgrowth of the cancer cells again, the mutant cells, and then they applied another therapy. And uh, essentially, they were in a deep remission at that point. Um, now, when we actually look at the uh, the genotypes and phenotypes here is quite interesting. So shown on the bottom left there is the antibody-based clustering data. And what we find is that there are a variety of different clusters. There are normal clusters shown on the right, the monocytes, dendritic cells, T cells, and so on. And then there's this broad, sloppy cluster of myeloid blasts. These are the cancer cells. Um, they have a distinctive surface profile that actually clusters them away from the normal cells. And now, and, and you can see it's color-coded according to the relapse. So uh, or, or the, the progression. So at relapse two, um, many of the cells 
were present in that myeloid uh, compartment. Uh, at therapy, salvage therapy, you see um, most of the cells are present in the normal population, so you've killed most of the cancer cells, and then it comes back, you get that green progression coming back into the cancer cell population and so on. Uh, and when we actually map the genetic mutations on, what we find is that on the right there, um, the, the cells with the malignant uh, genomes tend to also have the surface profiles that, that look like um, cancer cells, like myeloid blasts, whereas the normal cells cluster into normal cell populations and have wild-type genotypes. So this is a scenario where there is a very tight association between the genotype of the cell and the phenotype of the cell, kind of as an elementary understanding of cancer, right, where, you know, genotype drives phenotype, and so you expect naively a one-to-one -one correspondence. But it turns out not to always be true. Um, so this is a different patient where we found that um, multiple distinctive genotypes actually cor cor converged onto a single cluster of immunophenotypes. Okay, so now we have different genomes that are all behaving similarly cancer-like, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, and so what you can see here is that um, early on, you have a large population of wild type and this malignant population of red and orange cells with a KRAS mutations. Therapy is applied, the, the cancer cells are killed for the most part, but then the red population, which is a FLT3 mutation, comes back. And when we look at how, when we map the genotypes onto the different amino phenotype clusters, what we find is that we have our normal cell populations are shown as the blue populations. And you have this mixture of orange and red cells, um, which are distinct genotypes sharing one broad um, a spectrum of amino phenotypes. So this is a scenario where, you know, um, uh, targeting a mutation, which mutation do you target? Uh, it's not necessarily clear because you have actually multiple different mutations that are all giving rise to a similar kind of cancer phenotype. The, the last patient is actually the inverse of that. So this is a scenario where we take a single genotype and by applying a treatment, we actually get those cells to differentiate into multiple phenotypes. So here we have a, an orange, again, our wild type is blue. We have their, our, our orange and our, our um, red uh, mutants. We apply a therapy. We see that we, we kill many of the cancer cells. Uh, and then as relapse occurs, the uh, FLT3 IDT mutant uh, takes over. Um, and if we actually look at the, uh, uh, at the antibody uh, clusters at the, at the middle there, you can see that um, we have these multiple different uh, phenotypes that are all being, um, uh, that are all coming out of that uh, single cluster initially. Uh, and so you can actually map the genotype information on top of that and see that, uh, you know, essentially genotypes are showing up in all, cancer genotypes are showing up in all of the different phenotypic clusters. Uh, and so this is a scenario where, you know, if you're, many of the modern uh, therapies target antibody, uh, use antibodies to target certain surface profiles of, of cells. And if you were to do that here, it wouldn't necessarily work very well because the cancer cells have actually diversified into a variety of different surface profiles. So you might kill one of those profiles, but there are other cancer cells in other compartments that you're not targeting. And so this really shows, I guess the totality of these three patients really shows that it's a, you know, as we know, cancer is a complex disease. Sometimes you have a very tight relationship between genotype and phenotype. Sometimes you have a very complicated relationship between genotype and phenotype. And you really need to be able to map that in detail to be able to make the best um, treatment choices. Uh, so um, and the last bit here, what I want to tell you about is how we are now expanding beyond DNA analysis or nucleic acid analysis using sequencing to try to start adding functional assays. So, you know, so far we've really, really been constrained by the fact that we need to take all of that material coming out of a cell and get it onto a sequencer. And sequencers are great at sequencing, but they don't do you know, that's all they do. So what if we want to do a functional assay, like an assay based on uh, its ability, a cell's ability to invade or express a certain kind of enzyme uh, that can catalyze a specific kind of reaction or so on. Um, and for that, what we need is a way where we could take those cells and perform those assays on them before we go into the sequencing, which is destructive. And so we developed a, a, a variant of the technology now where um, before we go into our sequencing, we can print the droplets onto a substrate and perform uh, perform a functional assay. And the printer uses this, essentially it uses our sorter to take droplets out of our system and print them onto a substrate.
trait, as is shown here. Um, and it does it in an organized fashion. So every droplet on the substrate has a known cell in it that you've measured and you record the position of that cell on the substrate. Um, you could also add additional um, cells to the substrates uh, and you can add additional reagents because it's a deterministic droplet printer. You can hover over a spot and add multiple cells, multiple beads and cells, multiple reagents. And this is very powerful for doing a functional assay. And another nice thing about it is that it's an open system. So um, after we print our cells down, we have an open system that we can image, we can put into a culture hood, we can do mass spec on, um, and this all provides a lot of flexibility there. And we actually showed that these printed droplet arrays, we can go with a mass spec and scan them and get mass spec data out. And this is actually data showing that where we have an array of droplets that we've printed down. And on the right is the mass spectrum coming out of those droplets for a certain um, a certain uh, part of the spectrum where we're looking for a metabolite to be present. So um, basically, the idea is rather than just taking a bunch of cells and collecting them in a disordered way into a tube of droplets, we, we use this printer to pr print them down neatly onto a known array where we can do functional characterization. But at the end of the day, we will want to go into a sequencer to be able to correlate that functional information with all the sequencing information that you've seen that we can get. So how do we do that? And our idea is basically to um, index the droplets with coordinate, we call them coordinate oligos, where we, into the, each of those spots, we print a combination of, of oligos, which connotes a, an, an, a Y component and an X component. It tells you where on that array you are located, a given droplet is located. And these oligos get captured during the sequence analysis and essentially end up as reads to get in that cell cluster, in that barcode cluster. So for a given barcode group, when we sort all of the reads according to one barcode group, we're gonna see a bunch of reads for the genome, a bunch of reads for the proteome. If you're doing RNA analysis, you'll have RNA, and you'll now also have a, a bunch of reads corresponding to these X and Y components. And so now if you've done imaging or mass spec on this array, you know the coordinate by the location from your image, and now you also can associate that location with a given barcode group based on these coordinate oligos. And we've shown now that you can actually do this kind of analysis to get RNA-seq data where um, you can actually uh, get this kind of um, tethered optical and RNA sequencing-based analysis simultaneously. Um, there's still some loss in the process because transferring the material from the substrate into the sequencing workflow, we lose um, some of the material, some of the beads, some of the cells. And so our grid is is uh, splotchy in parts, but um, we're still getting roughly 50 to 60% of the, the spots show up on our sequence data, which is pretty good, and we think that can be improved. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of um, opportunity for what we can do with this technology. We've effectively been able now to decouple what happens you know, upstream from the sequencing and then the actual downstream component. So downstream, we, we definitely expect to be able to get DNA, RNA, and protein out of the single cell, at the single cell level. Uh, and now what we do upstream, we think the sky is the limit. You know, we can, we can print cells, we can image them, we can do chemical assays, we can do mass spec, we can do atomic force microscopy. And because everything is in a nice organized grid, we can correlate all of that information together. And we can link it to, by using these coordinate oligos, we can link it to our sequence data. And so I think there's quite a bit of um, multi-omic and um, other kinds of characterization we can do uh, using this technology, and it'll be scalable to the you know you know hundreds of thousands of single cells um, as current technologies for sequencing are currently capable of doing. So with that, I will uh, thank the lab who has done all of the work, and I will thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you.